This is Politics UK. I'm Leila Nafi. Hello and welcome to your weekly roundup of parliamentary highlights. I'll be joined by correspondents in Edinburgh and Cardiff and here in Westminster by our parliamentary correspondent, Sean Curran. Coming up on the programme. Apart from members of his own cabinet, how many people has the Prime Minister sent to Rwanda? <laughs> Instead of being on the side of the British people, he finds himself on the side of the people smugglers. Home Secretary signs a new treaty with Rwanda, but the Immigration Minister says it's unlikely to work and resigns from government. They can't solve their broken asylum system and they can't hold their party together. They do not deserve to run the country. They would like to view Rwanda exclusively through the prism of development and aid, but are deeply uncomfortable when a country like Rwanda earns the money. The Welsh Government is under pressure over test results in the schools. Regrettably, I have not heard from you today about anything substantive that you and your government have considered in light of this steep decline in performance. The Welsh Government already has in place a literacy plan, a numeracy plan, a plan to bring education leaders around the table together. There will be women and men, children and families in every constituency of this House whose lives have been forever touched by the infected blood scandal of the 1970s and the 1980s. And the Prime Minister is defeated in the Commons for the first time as MPs vote to speed up compensation for contaminated blood victims. Well, it has been a big week in Westminster for immigration policy. Sean Curran is here to talk us through it. Sean, tell us what was announced. Well, it's been a dramatic week and it's been a week that's revealed some of the tensions within the Conservative Party here at Westminster over this most sensitive of issues. There are two parts to the story. We'll begin with legal migration. Last week, we have the latest, most recent figures for net migration. So that's the difference between the number of people who arrive in the UK and the number of people who leave each year. And it was a record high. Now, that immediately led to criticism and unease on the Conservative benches. They weren't happy with the direction of travel with this. So the week began with the new, relatively new still, Home Secretary James Cleverley coming and making a statement to the Commons. He declared enough is enough and he said net migration was too high and he announced what he called his five-point plan to introduce some big changes. The British people will always do the right thing by those in need. But they also, and they are absolutely right to, want to reduce overall immigration numbers, not only by stopping the boats and shutting down illegal routes, but by well-managed reduction in legal migration too. People are understandably worried about housing, about GP appointments, about school places, and access to other public services when they can see their communities growing and growing quickly in numbers. Today, I can announce that we will go even further than those provisions already in place with a five-point plan to further curb immigration abuses and that will deliver the biggest ever reduction in net migration. In total, this package, plus our reduction in student dependence, will mean around 300,000 fewer people will come in future years than have come to the UK last year. The Prime Minister is just crashing around all over the place, reversing policies that he introduced, <laughs> criticising policies he defended six months ago, and introducing new po immigration policies without any of the economic policies to match. The previous Prime Minister was accused of being a shopping trolley, veering around from one side to the other. The current Prime Minister is clearly veering, but he certainly isn't steering. He's just climbed into someone else's shopping trolley, and he's being pushed around all over the place. <laughs> Professor Brian Bell, Chair of the Migration Advisory Committee, 
recently warned that limits in overseas care worker numbers could see a situation where lots of people won't get care. Does the Home Secretary recognise those remarks and recognise that his proposals may, ha may cause irrevocable harm to the care sector? We do not envisage a reduction in the number of people working in the care sector, but a reduction in the number of people that are coming with those uh, workers, people the vast majority of whom are not in work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, does my right honourable friend think That's it would right. be a good idea to have a cap on the number coming in? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, whilst I understand the calls for a cap, in practical terms, uh, managing a cap is difficult. We would want to make sure that we are, uh, we are being a, as generous as possible to the people who contribute to our society and to our economy. It isn't the problem with a skills-based immigration policy that it gives preferential access to bankers, to lawyers, to accountants, to economists, even though we have no need for such people in this country, we have plenty here, homegrown talent, but it actually makes it very difficult to recruit the people we do need, care workers, people to work in the food industry, in manufacturing, producing things generally, uh, or indeed in uh, the tourism industry. So will the Secretary of State consider moving away from this failed skills-based migration policy and instead move to one based on the needs of our economy? The vast, vast majority of the people that we've seen in the last couple of years' worth of immigration figures are in the lower end of the skills spectrum. It just does not bear out the point that he's made. There is great cynicism amongst the country when it comes to politicians talking about immigration. They've heard it all before. Can the Home Secretary promise to me that in the months ahead he will, he will explicitly demonstrate to the British public that this time it's different, this time we mean it, and this time the public will see change? Yeah. Uh, this package is subscribed to a cross-government. It will be delivered. And whilst we recognise that it won't be an instant fix, and I think the House has to be uh, realistic about the fact that this won't be an overnight fix, we are absolutely committed to bring these figures down and take back control of our borders. The Home Secretary there, James Cleverly, presenting some pretty big changes to immigration policy. So that was the legal migration bit. But James Cleverly was also out in Rwanda this week as well, wasn't he, signing a new treaty? And that came up at Prime Minister's Questions. Yes. So James Cleverly made that statement right at the start of the week. We saw his immigration minister, Robert Jenrick, sitting beside him, looking quite cheerful at times there. Soon after that statement, he headed off to Rwanda to sign this new treaty to basically help the government overcome the legal issues that had arisen when the Supreme Court ruled that the Rwanda policy was unlawful. So this is the plan to send some asylum seekers to Rwanda for processing. So James Cleverly went to Rwanda, he signed a new treaty, and then he came straight back. And by Wednesday, the treaty had been announced and it became the focus of Prime Minister's questions when the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, mocked Rishi Sunak over the government's approach to the whole Rwanda policy. If the purpose of the Rwanda gimmick was to solve a political headache of the Tories' own making, to get people out of the country who they simply couldn't deal with, then it's been a resounding success. <laughs> After all, they've managed to send three Home Secretaries there, <laughs> an achievement for which the whole country can be grateful. So, apart from members of his own cabinet, how many people has the Prime Minister sent to Rwanda? Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, as I've been clear before, we will do everything it takes. Mr Speaker, we will do everything it takes to get this scheme working so that we can indeed stop the boats. And that's why this week we have signed a new legally binding treaty with Rwanda, which together with new legislation will address all the concerns that have been raised, because everyone should be in no doubt about our absolute commitment to stop the boats and get flights off. But what we heard this morning from his own ministers was that was that they would scrap the scheme even when it is operational and working. As again, once again, Mr Speaker, once again, instead of being on the side of the British people, he finds himself on the side of the people smugglers. Yeah. Article 19 of the treaty says the parties shall make arrangements for the United Kingdom to resettle a portion of Rwanda's most vulnerable refugees in the United Kingdom. 
So how many refugees from Rwanda will be coming here to the UK under the treaty? Let me just get the honourable gentleman up to speed on what we are doing. Reduce the number of illegal arrivals from Albania by 90%. Increase the number of illegal working raids by 50%. Because of all the action, we've taken the number of small boat arrivals down by a third, Madam Deputy Speaker. But what is the honourable gentleman's plan? Because it comes down to he just simply doesn't have a plan to address this problem. On a, but no, no, I'm probably being unfair because he does have a plan. It's to cook up a deal with the EU that would see us accept 100,000 illegal migrants. Migration's trebled on his watch, and all he can do is make up numbers about the Labour Party. It's really pitiful. I'm not actually sure the Prime Minister can have read this thing. Article 4 says the scheme is capped at Rwanda's capacity. That's 100. Article 5 says Rwanda can turn them away if they want. Article 19 says we actually have to take refugees from Rwanda. How much did this fantastic deal cost us? Prime Minister. Madam Deputy Speaker, as the Home Secretary was crystal clear about, there is no incremental money. There is no incremental money that has been provided. This is about is ensuring that the concerns of the Supreme Court have all been addressed in a legally binding treaty that will allow us to operationalise the scheme. So another pretty lively session of Prime Minister's questions there on this issue of immigration. But, Sean, we've heard already from the relatively new Home Secretary, James Cleverley, who's been out and about talking about the policies that he now finds himself responsible for. But we also heard this week, didn't we, from one of his predecessors in office, Suella Braverman. What does she have to say? Yes, so Suella Braverman was sacked by Rishi Sunak in his uh, reshuffle. It's a parliamentary tradition that... Ministers can come along, or ex-ministers, can come along and make a personal statement to the Commons. Now, when it was announced that Suella Bravman was coming to the Commons, I think everybody had a pretty good idea that this was not going to be good news for Rishi Sunak. Because, of course, when she left, there were some stinging criticisms in the letter that she wrote to the Prime Minister and, and then published. And so when she stood up, a little while after Prime Minister's questions, sometimes ex-ministers are very lucky and they get to stand up just as Prime Minister's questions is over, and that puts the Prime Minister on a difficult spot. But there was a gap. But a little later, on Wednesday afternoon, she stood up, and as expected, she had some more harsh words for Rishi Sunak and the government. I want to talk about the crisis on which I spent more time working than any other. Mass, uncontrolled, illegal immigration. We are all here familiar with the problem. Tens of thousands of mostly young men, many with values and social mores at odds with our own, mm -hmm. pouring into our country day after day, month after month, year after year. Many come from safe countries. Many are not refugees, but are economic migrants. Yes. All have paid thousands of pounds to criminal gangs to break into Britain. All have come from a safe country, France, who, let's face it, should be doing so much more to stop them. This is putting unsustainable pressure on our public finances and our public services. We made some progress during my tenure as Home Secretary. The overall crossings have fallen by 30%. The number of illegal Albanian arrivals down by 90%. And we were starting to close down asylum hotels. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, crossings are down is not the same as stopping the boats. And as Home Secretary, I consistently advocated for legislative measures that would have secured the delivery of our Rwanda partnership as soon as the bill became law. The Conservative Party faces electoral oblivion in a matter of months if we introduce yet another bill destined to fail. Do we fight for sovereignty or do we let our party die? Now, I may not have always found the right words in the past, Madam Deputy Speaker, but I refuse, I refuse to sit by and allow us to fail. The trust that millions of people placed in us cannot be discarded as an inconvenient detail. If we summon the political courage 
to do what is truly necessary, difficult though it may be, to fight for the British people, we will regain their trust. And if the Prime Minister leads that fight, he has my total support. Thank you. Yeah. Suella Braverman there, stressing the importance of getting the Rwanda policy done. But we did, Sean, get some legislation from the government later trying to actually make sure that the Rwanda plan does get off the ground and can't be challenged in the courts. But it didn't seem to be good enough, did it, for the immigration minister, the man who had been in charge of that very policy for a year? No. So this was quite a dramatic Wednesday. We'd already had Prime Minister's questions. We had Suella Braverman's statement. And then, late in the evening... Uh, we heard that the Home Secretary was going to come back to the Commons and make another statement. The government was going to publish legislation to, again, address these legal issues. So basically, the government's approach to the problem that the Supreme Court had presented it with was twofold. We'll get a treaty and then we'll bring in legislation in Parliament. So James Cleverley came back. You'll see in a minute that he was there with the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, but there was no sign of the Immigration Minister Robert Jenrick, because he had quit, basically saying that he didn't think that the government's plans were going to solve the problem, and he suggested it was all an example of hope over experience. It made for another dramatic parliamentary moment. We will introduce legislation tomorrow in the form of the Safety of Rwanda Asylum and Immigration Bill to give effect to the judgment of Parliament that Rwanda is a safe country. It is a bill which is lawful, it is fair, and it is necessary. Because people will only stop coming here illegally when they know that they cannot stay here and that they will be detained and quickly removed to a safe third country. Country. We've got the Home Secretary making the statement, but the rumours that the Immigration Minister oh. has resigned. Oh. Well, where is he? Where is he? Perhaps where that he can where make that the first question that he answers, whether he still has an Immigration Minister yeah, in place. Robert? They've got open warfare among their Not backbenches. Really the starting gun Robert? fired on the Robert? next leadership election. And once Shambles. again, the whole country paying the price for this chaos. They can't solve their own Tory votes crisis. They can't defend our border security. They can't solve their broken asylum system. And they can't hold their party together. They do not deserve to run the country. Britain deserves better than this. It is, I think, a rather distasteful state of affairs that they would like to view Rwanda exclusively through the prism of development and aid, but are deeply uncomfortable when a country like Rwanda earns the money. And I think that is a rather distasteful state of affairs. This is an assault on human rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should not let this stand from this House because human rights are universal and they are for everybody, not who the Home Secretary thinks that they should apply to. This bill is a dangerous distraction. It is part of a march towards fascism. Every single piece... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do not say that lightly, Mr Deputy Speaker. I do not say these things lightly. She might reflect on the appropriateness of throwing the word fascism around when we are bringing a bill, a bill upon which every member of this House will be allowed to vote, because we are in a democracy. The Home Secretary has twice refused to answer the question of whether the Immigration Minister has resigned, but he has, hasn't he? Um, and can you just tell us, has he resigned because he thinks that this policy doesn't stand an earthly chance of working? Mm. Or has he resigned because he's embarrassed that a British government would actually put ministers above the law? In other words, has he resigned because he thinks this policy is crazy or because he doesn't think it's crazy enough? <laughs> the Honourable Gentleman uh, is, is always has an amusing turn of phrase, uh, but his question is, is uh, not one for me. If he wants to know what uh, any particular member of this House is thinking, he should ask that member of the House. If the Immigration Minister, who is a good man, has resigned over this bill, that is deeply worrying. The Home Secretary pointedly ducked several questions about individual appeals. So can I ask him very specifically, 
as every person we would seek to send to Rwanda is an individual. If under this legislation, those people can continue to appeal and appeal in order to delay being put on a flight, what's the point of the bill? The point is that uh, an appeal process is an important part of any legal process. It will not preclude people uh, from being sent to Rwanda uh, on uh, this scheme. And I would make the point, I would make the point that uh, this scheme is robust, it strengthens our position, it ensures that the decisions that we make in this House, that he, I and others make in this House, define the UK's immigration policy, not decisions made elsewhere by people unelected. James Cleverly, the Home Secretary there, I think he did eventually uh, confirm that Robert Jenrick had indeed resigned while he was on his feet in the chamber. But on that legislation that he was talking about, where does that go next? So the legislation will be debated and voted on for the first time next week on Tuesday. So that'll be a big moment. Uh, as things stand, we don't know exactly how it will all play out, but this will be the first chance for MPs to debate the general principles and it'll be their first chance to cast a vote. Sean, many thanks for the moment. We will be back with you later in the programme. But let's go to Holyrood now and speak to our correspondent, Andrew Kerr. Andrew, there's been concern this week, hasn't there, about the Scottish Government's budget and funding for public services? Yes, that's right. We have the Scottish budget due to be presented on the 19th of December. But there is a problem. It's a £60 billion package and there's a black hole of at least a billion pounds. So an emergency cabinet meeting was called this week to discuss that, an extra cabinet meeting. And on Wednesday here in Parliament, there was a debate on the Scottish fiscal framework. Don't run away, it sounds very dull. We're staying on the budget issues because we'll hear from the opposition and what they're saying in just a second. But first of all, let's hear from the Deputy First Minister who's criticising the Chancellor's autumn statement. Once again, the UK government has chosen to pursue an austerity budget that will have a profound consequence for Scotland's public services. As the Institute of Fiscal Studies has said of the autumn statement, the tax cuts are paid for by planned real cuts in public service spending. Even with the fiscal framework in place, levels of funding for the Scottish budget remain closely tied to spending decisions by the UK government. Decisions to starve services in England hit our budget in Scotland as the UK government's failure to invest in services in England means that the devolved administrations in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland do not receive adequate consequentials. They'll say on the one hand they say we have record investment and on the other hand they say we don't have enough. In Deputy Presiding Officer, it's outcomes that ultimately matter and we have an increase in the waiting times in our health service, and we have increasingly poor health outcomes from our health service. How you spend the money matters. The fiscal framework is only one side of the coin. and How the Scottish Government manages the budget is the other. That projected £1 billion funding gap for the upcoming budget between the government's spending pledges and the funds that it has available. That figure rising to £1.9 by 27 28 And a large portion of that budget is determined by income tax receipts raised right here in Scotland. And the utter failure of the government to grow the Scottish economy results in the stagnant low-wage investment economy, low-investment low economy that the SNP is holding Scotland back within. Now, the Scottish Government have promised a council tax freeze for next year, and opposition parties have been critical of that, accusing them of further compounding budget issues. But, of course, many of their constituents will be welcoming that freeze. Indeed. And, Andrew, the COP28 climate summit is still going on in the background in Dubai. The First Minister, Hamza Youssef, was there. But there's been a debate about nuclear power this week in Holyrood. Yes, that's right. COP's still going on in Dubai at the moment. The Conservatives were highlighting a declaration from more than 20 countries to triple nuclear energy capacity by 2050. Now, the Scottish Government here is opposed to nuclear energy. They say it's not needed, it's too expensive and it's not safe. But the Scottish Conservatives very strongly disagree with that. I went to Torness the other day and saw a very safe nuclear power station, oh, yeah. a safe nuclear power station that employed plenty of people in Scotland. And I asked them if they were to redesign the nuclear power station, what they'd change. They said nothing. 
What they do is good for Scotland and keeps jobs in the local economy. Why won't you accept that on the belief that safety is the paramount failing of nuclear power, which no one else agrees with? Cabinet yeah. Secretary. Well, I think the evidence of the, the, the alleged hacking of Sellafield this week and what we have seen from Russia's invasion of Ukraine points very clearly at the worries that are around safety. And these are not just concerns that, that we have here in Scotland. We know that colleagues in the European Union are either, many of them are either moving away or continue to oppose new nuclear. But of course, this announcement, and, and Mr. Mount Mountain's question uh, previously spoke of uh, hypocrisy. It uh, comes off the back of, uh, of the Prime Minister uh, spending as much time in the air in his private jet going to COP as he actually did spending time uh, actually negotiating a route by which we can address the climate emergency uh, and uh, can take advantage of the economic opportunities that we have in Scotland by making a just transition to renewables. Now, the minister there was raising concerns about Russian hacking. Now, the Scottish government obviously used planning regulations to keep a lid on nuclear energy in Scotland. But if there was a change of government here, that policy could indeed change in the future. And Andrew, just finally, there's been a lot of focus this week on the education system and international test results in Scottish schools, hasn't there? That came up at First Minister's questions. That's right. These are the... PISA figures, the Programme for International Student Assessment, this international check on 15-year-olds looks at standards and reading, maths and science. And sadly for Scotland, the figures have slipped. It shows a long-term decline in all of those three areas. Now, Scottish ministers are partly blaming COVID for that. They're saying it had a profound impact on education. So this was the main issue at First Minister's questions brought up by the Conservatives and also by the Scottish Labour Party. This SNP government's record on education is a litany of broken promises. Closing the attainment gap, promise broken. Guaranteeing class sizes of 18 or under, promise broken. Free school meals for all primary school pupils, promise broken. A digital device for every pupil, promise broken. Year after year, the SNP make promises to Scotland's children, but year after year, they fail to deliver. And after 16 years, there's no one else to blame. So will the First Minister apologise to the people of Scotland for destroying our once world-leading education system? First Minister. No, I won't apologise for a record number of young people aged 19 who have now secured a university place this year. No, I won't apologise for the 94.3% of 16- to 19-year-olds that were participating in employment, education or training over the past year. So yes, there are challenges. Yes, the PISA results are serious and we will reflect on that, consider those results and come forward next week with more detail on the action we will take. But because of this government's actions, because of the SNP government's actions, we have more young people going into positive destinations before and that's not something that I'm going to apologise for. Now, we often hear that education was the pride of Scotland, that it was world-renowned. We hear that from our politicians. That perhaps is partly why these results hit so hard. We're getting more information from the First Minister next week about this, but opposition politicians are accusing him of burying his head in the sand. Leila. Andrew, many thanks. Andrew Kerr there, our Scotland political correspondent. Well, back to Westminster now, and Sean Curran is still with us. Sean, we saw earlier in the headlines, didn't we, that MPs had voted to speed up compensation for victims of the infected blood scandal. That was actually a defeat for the government, not something that happens very often. No, this was the first time that Rishi Sunak had been defeated since he became Prime Minister on a whipped vote. This was um, a debate during a bill, which is called the Victim and Prisoners Bill, and there was an amendment brought forward led by Labour MP Dame Diana Johnson. She had a lot of support from across the Commons, and these MPs wanted to basically enact proposals that had come from Sir Brian Langstaff, the former High Court judge who has been leading an inquiry into the infected blood scandal. And that's when as many as 30,000 people in the 1970s and 80s were given contaminated blood products by the NHS. 
There will be women and men, children and families in every constituency of this House whose lives have been forever touched by the infected blood scandal of the 1970s and the 1980s. As we've already heard, one uh, person dies on average every four days as a result of the scandal and many of those who've spent decades campaigning for justice are no longer alive. And I also just want to again reiterate this point about the government's approach to the victims of the Post Office Horizon scandal, where victims of that appalling injustice are to be compensated prior to the conclusion of the Post Office Horizon public inquiry. And I would argue that those infected and, uh, infected and affected by the worst treatment disaster in the history of the NHS are equally entitled to compensation before the name plaques come down and the lights go out on the inquiry headquarters. I have a constituent which I had to deal with when I first got elected as a Member of Parliament in 2010. And today's bill is from the Justice Department. Justice delayed is justice denied. It is absolutely crucial all victims get treated with parity and therefore we should not delay any further in making sure they get the justice. And I thank her for her work and support her amendment in this regard. We have studied very carefully the proposals that have been made by the Right Honourable Lady and supported widely across this House. The Government, as she said, has already accepted the moral case for compensation and is grateful for the work of Sir Brian Langstaff. The Government has great sympathy for the Right Honourable Lady's amendment and the intention to ensure that the legal groundwork is in place to enable a delivery body to be established. I can therefore confirm the Government will bring forward its own amendment when the Bill reaches the Lords which will put in place the necessary legislative framework and timescales for a delivery body for compensation for the victims of infected blood to be established, in line with the overall objective set out in the Right Honourable Lady's new clause 27. This will ensure that the Government is able to move quickly as soon as the inquiry reports. Got a flavour there of the cross-party support that Dame Diana Johnson's amendment got. But you heard that from the Justice, Justice Minister there trying to make a concession to try to win over some MPs, but it didn't really succeed, did it? It didn't, uh, because Conservative MPs rebelled and the government was defeated. It was a, a narrow uh, victory for the campaigners, but it was a victory nonetheless. And it was significant that the Conservative rebels came from right across the Conservative Party and also quite a lot of Conservatives did not vote at all. So the government had a real problem there. Sean, many thanks. Again, we will come back to you again shortly. But let's go to the Welsh Parliament now and speak to Tuleri Glynn-Jones, our correspondent there. Tuleri, we were talking earlier about those international test results in Scottish schools. And those test scores were also a big issue in Wales this week. Yes, indeed. Uh, those results or Wales's poor performance in them have been a thorn in the side of the Welsh Government for many years now. But just before the pandemic, those results had seemed to turn a corner here um, with a great deal of improvement uh, in the results just before the pandemic, albeit not up to the standard of the other UK nations. But COVID-19 casts a long shadow and like most countries, there has been been a decline in the results here in Wales but here there was a steeper decline than in the other UK nations so Andrew RT Davis the leader of the Conservatives here in the Senate has concluded that it's that it's 20 years of Welsh Labour government that's to blame for the poor performance and not the pandemic and now the leader in waiting sitting two seats from you Jeremy Miles as Education Minister coming here and playing down the significance of these results when they're presented to the Senate. There is a massive, massive deficit for the Welsh Government to work with the education community here in Wales to make us more internationally competitive. Regrettably, I have not heard from you today about anything substantive that you and your Government have considered in light of this steep decline in performance. The Welsh Government already has in place a literacy plan a numeracy plan, a plan to bring education leaders around the table together in January to reflect on this uh, set of results and then to make sure that the path of improvement that we were on the last time PISA results were published is a path that we return to for the future. Now, Mark Drake for the First Minister did concede that the results were disappointing 
pointing, but was insistent that they shouldn't be seen in isolation and that the government shouldn't change course. But the Education Minister was also asked about those test results. Yes, uh, he gave a statement, again, acknowledging that the results weren't up to standard. But he, again, blamed COVID and the discrepancy in the way the result was calculated in England and Scotland for the disparity. But he said he was convinced that the new curriculum, which has now been fully rolled out, but wasn't fully rolled out at the time these tests were taken, would make a big difference. Uh, but opposition parties wouldn't accept it. And there are still major concerns uh, that the Welsh Government isn't taking this seriously. Seriously enough. Our new curriculum and approach to education has been supported and encouraged by the OECD, reflecting their advice about how to make sure an education system is fit for the future. They highlight the importance of resilience, equity, learning and well-being, all of which are central to our new curriculum. For maths, Wales is five points behind Scotland, 26 points behind England. For reading, Wales has 27 points behind Scotland and 30 points behind England. For science, Wales is 10 points behind Scotland and 30 points behind England. So, Minister, will you now take this opportunity to apologise to our Welsh learners and outline what steps you will finally be taking to address these calamitous failings? Clearly, uh, it doesn't matter how brilliant the teaching is if the child's not in school they're not going to be learning so uh, clearly that's one of the really big issues that we all face uh, we can't row back the clock on what we did during covid where we kept kids off school in order to protect older generations as children themselves were not in the main uh, impacted on on covid but that redoubles our responsibility to enable them to catch up Jeremy Miles did agree with Jenny Rathbone about the government's responsibility and said it was why his government was investing what he called considerable sums of money in getting young people through this difficult time. And to Larry, just away from those test results, the Welsh Government has put forward some new legislation which is meant to streamline the planning system when it comes to big infrastructure projects. Yes, the infrastructure bill is currently in its second stage, which means it's being scrutinised by committees and debated in the chamber behind me. Um, it's designed to make... To, to streamline uh, big infrastructure projects, things like wind farms and pylons, and to make sure that they move more swiftly through the planning process. And that's something that we know the Welsh Government is going to have to do more of if it wants to hit its net zero targets. But the chairs of two committees have raised concerns, uh, the Climate Change and Infrastructure Committee and the Legislation and Justice Committee. They've both raised concerns uh, that the bill is so far-reaching um, that it's essentially a power grab by the Welsh Government that would mean the Parliament would be bypassed in future. Now, the Minister has argued that this approach offers the Welsh Government flexibility. However, it does also sacrifice the much needed certainty and clarity for those people who will be affected by this bill's provisions. So this approach not only undermines the Senate's capacity to conduct thorough scrutiny, but it also casts a shadow of doubt on how effectively the bill will deliver on its policy intentions. We do not consider it appropriate to use a bill as a vehicle to avoid a future bill where the use of primary legislation would be the constitutionally appropriate mechanism and means. In our view, including many regulation-making powers to future-proof a bill takes away powers from future Senevi and is not an acceptable practice. These powers will rest with the executive, with ministers, with the government that is, as, a, 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 as of now, unelected for the future. These are enduring powers. They are not one-off powers. We have been asked to delegate to this minister and this government. In the end, what we want here is a consenting regime for Wales, which is clear and straightforward on both sides, which allows us to be a world leader in the development of our infrastructure whilst protecting our environment and making sure that our communities remain engaged and happy with the infrastructure that, after all, serves them as much as it serves anyone else. Deal. 
The minister went on to say that she was comfortable that the bill struck the right balance between more powers to get things done and uh, streamlining the process. Obviously, the committees aren't so sure, but this just gives us a glimpse of how difficult it is to expedite the planning process and a glimpse, perhaps, of the difficulties to come for any other government hoping to bring in similar kinds of legislation. Tuleri, thank you. Tuleri Glynn-Jones there, our Wales political correspondent at the Senate for us. Well, let's go back to Westminster for one last time with Sean, who is still here with us. Now, our viewers will remember David Cameron's dramatic return to government as Foreign Secretary. But this week, he answered questions in the House of Lords for the first time. Yes, it's been more than 40 years since there's been a Foreign Secretary in the House of Lords. There is a committee in the House of Commons, the Procedure Committee, busy looking at ways that MPs can hold David, now Lord Cameron, to account. But in the meantime, the House of Lords has made some changes to its procedures so that once a month we will see Lord Cameron in his role as Foreign Secretary coming up and answering a series of questions. So it was the first time this week and it's fair to say he drew a big crowd in the House of Lords. Can I say about how much we all welcome him here today for this first in monthly interrogation? in the House of Lords, which I'm sure he's likely to enjoy. After all, by his very presence in this chamber, he's given a fillip to those of us who have to go around saying, do you know who I used to be? <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, can I commend him um, on the fact that his very first visit um, as Foreign Secretary was to Ukraine? Uh, because the Ukrainians are not just fighting for their country and for their land and for their lives, they're also fighting very much for us. And surely the fact is that they don't actually need more visits and more speeches. They need more weapons, they need more guns, they need more ammunition, and they need more equipment. Uh, and in that context, therefore, could I ask the Foreign Secretary this question? Why was there no additional military aid offered in the Chancellor of the Exchequer's autumn budget? And why is there no perspective on military aid for 2024 when the 2023 money is going to run out in a few weeks' time in March next year? Yeah. Well, can I thank the noble lord for his question and also say that I absolutely remember not only who he is but who he used to be and he was an incredibly effective Secretary General of NATO and did fantastic yeah. work. Yeah. To answer his question directly, I mean, I think we have given £4.6 billion pounds of military support. We'll continue to give the support that's necessary. One of the things I found very impressive about going to Ukraine is how much they rate our support, how they refer to us as their number one partner. And it's been very good to see that. We have to get used to seeing David Cameron in front of red benches rather than green benches, don't we, Sean? But just before we go, what are we expecting in Parliament next, next week? Because we've talked a lot about the Rwanda bill. Presumably that's going to come for its first vote in Parliament too. Yes, that's probably going to be the big parliamentary moment of the week. But there are only a few parliamentary sitting days until Christmas and the government wants to get a lot done. So it's not going to be the only bill that will be debated next week. We're also going to have the leasehold reform bill and the finance bill, which is obviously a big, important government bill. Both of those bills will be debated and there will be government votes through the week. Right, so a lot to get through before Christmas. Sean Curran, our parliamentary correspondent, many thanks indeed for being with us. Well, that is all for Politics UK for this week. Politics Live will be back on Monday at 12.15 on BBC Two and on iPlayer. But from all of us here, goodbye.